All right, well, folks, we're going to start up early. Um, welcome. I don't know if we really need the microphone here, but we'll see how it picks up. Uh, my name is Jim Foley. I'm, I'm the moderator for today's panel. We have three wonderful panelists. We'll give them a chance to introduce themselves. The, the topic that we're here to discuss is, you know, much like all the other topics, you know, it's culture-based. You know, how do you take a culture and what are the benefits of that? And I think, you know, we don't need to spend too much time getting into that um, because it's kind of like a given in this whole conference. The question is, though, for our, for our panel is how do you translate that culture? Or how do you get that culture adopted by your franchisees so that they have a culture where they become an employer of choice without mandating that they do certain things? Because, you know, especially around employment laws and control issues and stuff like that, it's really getting to be some thin ice. So we're going to be talking today about how you, I think it's going to come down to how do you live the culture and how do you translate that down into your franchise system so that they can enjoy the benefits of a healthy culture and, and retention and not deal with turnover consistently. So let's just start with some introductions. Carolyn, why don't you take the lead there? Okay. My name is Carolyn Thurston. I'm the founder and CEO of Wisdom Senior Care. We help keep wisdom happy at home. Uh, yeah, my name is John Evans. I'm founder and CEO of Everline Coatings and Services. Uh, uh, originally started in Canada about 12 years ago, launched in the United States last year. And uh, yeah, we're, uh, we're, uh, we do parking lot line painting and pavement maintenance. So everywhere out there has, a, every building out there has a parking lot and they all need to be done uh, every year. All right, my name is uh, Ken Parsons. I'm the co-founder with my brother Ryan Parsons and we are known as the brothers that just do gutters. Gutters. We do gutter installation, repair, maintenance, uh, soffit and fascia, wood rot replacement, anything that has to do with the gutter, that's what we do. And um, Ryan and I have been uh, in business since uh, 1999. Before that, I was a teacher. And one summer, a guy asked me if I wanted to do gutters, and I told, turned them down a couple times. And then uh, finally, I had to work because teaching doesn't pay during the summer. And then uh, I did that. I loved it so much. I didn't go back to my teaching job, and I threw my degree right in the gutter, and that was it. In 1999, I started my business. We franchised it in 2015, and we are currently standing at about 425 units sold and about 120-plus franchisees. So why don't we stay down with you, Ken, in terms of maybe just a brief introduction of how you would summarize your company's culture and then you know, challenges or successes you had trying to translate that down to your franchise system. So when I first started out, I was, I didn't know nothing about business. I was just um, a hard worker. I knew how to work hard and that was ingrained in me in a young age. And, uh, but I didn't know how to run a business uh, that was beyond myself. Uh, so when Ryan and I became partners, probably around 2002, 2003, uh, things started to change and we started thinking more about how do we, how do we grow this thing so that we can both afford to get paid by it. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, it wasn't until we started deviating, um, which, you know, sometimes you look back and you think, man, if I could have done that differently, but, you know, now that I'm sitting where I'm at, because when you're going through hard times in business, sometimes you're just like, oh my gosh, you know, what am I doing uh, <laughs> in business? And, uh, and that was one of the moments that during the Great Recession, uh, we, uh, we, were, we started deviating. We started deviating and losing our focus in what got us the success that we had. And we started doing all things construction. And when the recession hit in 2007, half, eight, I mean, we, we just about lost our shirts. Uh, but out of that, we rebranded and we got back to our main focus that had uh, got us to success, which was the gutter business. And out of that, was birth the name the brothers that just do gutters and and from that time going through that recession I really had to self-reflect I think self-reflecting is really important uh, in business because we as the leaders in our business are the ones that are going to directly influence culture uh, the level of engagement alignment and collaboration that we're going to have with our franchisees is going to be a direct result of the investment that we make in ourselves. And that was something big that Ryan and I started to do. Uh, we were very systematic, organized, disciplined people. 
but what we needed to do was we need to marry that learning and the art and science of learning into the systems that we created so that we could have employee retention uh, long term because we were struggling with that just like any business struggles with employee retention you can attract them into your business monetarily but to hold them there is the culture aspect that keeps them there um, and and make them want to take a bullet for you uh, and be a part of the company so that was something that was uh, really integral to our our growth uh, to us scaling beyond ourselves and raising up leaders within our organization that were developing leaders ultimately without us having to be there to do it and create that opportunity for the people that we were hiring and then in turn them doing that and then that as being the example to our franchisees them seeing that in action allows them to have a playbook to follow not just a system but a playbook to follow on how they should be running their organization investing in themselves and the people they're creating opportunities for very good john summary of your culture and how you get it to permeate absolutely so um so when i, I i've always uh, so I, uh, before i started everline i was a franchisee for uh, uh, for a, a student painting brand uh, you know, one of, one of the top performers in North America there. So I'm, I, I, you know, as an operator, a business operator, a, a major driver pushing forward, um, but also at the same time, you know, uh, uh, it's really important to me that uh, you have a, a friendly, not so stuffy corporate culture in your uh, in your organization. And uh, that was always a thing. I always kind of operated even uh, when we, you know, when we were a single location uh, with, uh, you know, kind of an anti-stuffy uh, culture uh, in, in a way. And um, so what, uh, uh, where, where it all started for me was, you know, just even starting off with my first, uh, first crew, um, you know, how do you, I, I was started in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, which is an oil, uh, oil and gas town. And when I first started, oil was $110. So there was high paying oil, uh, oil companies that I was competing against for good people uh, in my organization, which was challenging. So it was all initially all about, okay, well, how do you get somebody connected and, and want to, to be a part of this, you know, you know a little old line painting company uh, that was in my backyard at the time. And we had one form of comfort and it was a couch and uh, eventually got a wasp nest in it. So we couldn't even have that. <laughs> uh, we're like, we can't have nice things. This is how it is. But um, uh, really as the, the organization grew, and this was uh, a, a, a big reason, you know, a reason why these conferences are so great because along the way, you know, companies growing, companies growing, it's beginning to scale and, you know, now really to present that, you know, that, that driver culture, the, uh, that also remains, you know, in, in a friendly environment, you know, that's, uh, that, that's extremely collaborative and just that, that sort of piece there where people really enjoy being a part of the story. They're not just a cog in the wheel. Uh, it was actually uh, at, uh, uh, I think, yeah, we won the first uh, ne uh, IFA's Next Gen and Franchising Competition back, uh, back in 2015 or 16 when they, when they had it there. And uh, I was introduced to Dina Dwyer and uh, Mary Thompson out of it was then Dwyer Group, now Neighborly. And uh, they, you know, more or less really introduced me to the concept of values and how you can operationalize those values. And that was the very beginning of me starting to, okay, systemizing exactly, you know, how the way that I do things, the way that I approach meetings, the way that I, uh, you know, that, that we get work done, that we hire people, we fire people, we do all these things. It's like, how, how do we put the little elements of magic that I put into things and how do we uh, systemize it? So it started with really uh, nailing down those, uh, those values and, uh, you know, and just really enforcing them that they're not just you know, words on a wall uh, that they are taken very, very seriously. And even to this day, if I even catch a franchisee or employee or whatnot, just kind of like making any light of them, I, I correct them on that. Uh, and it's like, listen, these are uh, what makes this whole company. And, uh, and I, I'd say, too, um, I was, uh, you know, and I've experienced that uh, in other organizations that I've had um, because, you know, it's if you, uh, if, I don't know if I was in a fraternity in university, I don't know if there's any Phi Gamma Deltas in here, but uh, uh, we, you know, you look at some, an organization like that and you look at the culture that has been tr translated through all the generations in a fraternity, it's all based around common values. We all had a very common experience and so that's, that's when we uh, got, got started with that there. So, so that was just more or less like how do you transmit the message 
And then our specific message, it was, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're driven, we're ambitious. And, you know, so, uh, you know, that's our, our core values. We're dedicated to resourceful, integrity-focused, value-based, excelling, and nourishing. And they're on every, they're, it's uh, required to be on in every, uh, every common area that, uh, that Everline has where any crews congregate and they have to uh, re reference them at the beginning of, uh, of key uh, company meetings and, and all that sort of stuff. So that's where it all began and uh, just maintaining that as, uh, as we've gone on. Very good. Thank you. Carolyn, you're, um, you're going to people's homes. You're sending pe into people's homes and right. with elderly who are mm -hmm. very vulnerable where this stuff is really, really critical. So maybe talk for a little bit about how, how you've accomplished that. Yeah, and thank you for mentioning that. But um, for those of you who just came in, I'm Carolyn, I'm Carolyn Thurston. Uh, that's a, yeah. Can you hear me? No. Yeah. So I'm Carolyn Thurston with Wisdom Senior Care, and we provide in-home care service. And I always tell the franchise, new franchise owners that come in, think about if you were to send a person into your parents' home, would you send that person into your family's home? One thing is that our clients that come to us, they are really having faith in us that we're going to do our due diligence. I take the home as a personal opportunity because not everyone will invite you into their like personal space, right? And I use myself, for example, I don't just invite anybody into my home. So when you get an invitation, that really means something. And so that's how we need to treat our caregivers that we're bringing on board. I remind them that we're not a staffing agency because that's a differentiator for us. So therefore, we take time to make sure with our core values. So the number one core value that we have and we use it throughout all of our organization is faith. So it starts off with that client who has come to Wisdom. They're having faith that we're going to provide them with the right type of caregivers who are going to be have a commitment, which is our second core value, right? They're going to be committed. When they say they're going to um, take this position and arrive at what time, they're going to keep their commitment, that integrity. They're having... Um, faith in us that we've checked their backgrounds, right? And we're not perfect and we tell everyone because just because something's not on someone's um, criminal background doesn't mean that something later could happen, but long as you're doing all your due diligence. So we talk about that integrity and how important that is and how to make sure that you as a business owner, your staff, your administration, they're doing their due diligence that helps with the integrity piece. And the, I, the other core value is compassion. There's no way, even as a business owner, no way that even as a caregiver that you can provide care or stay in this long enough. Some people come and say, you know, um, I think I'm going to try it. And I always tell them, no, you can't. It's either you love it or you hate it. There's no in-between. And so we have to help our franchise owners help their staff understand how do you determine if someone's just, you know, trying this out and, they're, and your clients are so good, they've lived so long that they can tell within 20 seconds. And they'll say to me, Carolyn, you know what? She's not going to be here long. He's not going to be here long. Because think about it. We're dealing with people who have been around a long time. And they understand people. So it's important that we really look at those core values. So faith, compassion, the commitment, the integrity. And then lastly, what leads up, and I tell all our franchise owners, when you get a caregiver in, our goal is to help them grow. So in our culture, we believe in growth from within. So we have caregivers who have started off as a direct caregiver, but they have been able to grow throughout the whole aspect of the agency, even to the point that we have one that became a franchise owner. So letting them know there's a career opportunity, a career ladder, helps them be able to retain um, caregivers. So they have caregivers on that have been in um, with our main office since I started in 2006. So it says there's something there, there's culture there, and that's what we implement to our franchisees 
and that creates loyalty. So some of them have been in business now for five years, and they're having caregivers that are staying on with them for three, four, and five years. So that's how we, we help them. Great, great. So one of the uh, panelists in the previous panel downstairs mentioned the importance of intake. You know, it's, it's hard to have a discussion after the fact. Um, maybe talk for a little bit about filters that you use or yellow flags you've seen in, in, in the intake process that would cause you to stay away from a candidate or embrace that candidate. So start with Ken, maybe. Um, so, I, I mean, it starts pretty much with um, when you have a potential franchisee coming in and whoever, we use uh, Fastlane uh, to validate uh, for us and they've gotten to know our brand and our core values and uh, the things that we're looking for. Uh, a lot of brands have personas that you're looking for. Um, in our brand, we're attracting people from all kinds of walks of life, so that kind of went out the window for us. Um, so we have people from all different uh, backgrounds. Uh, but one of the things that I think is really important for us when we have a candidate come to our Meet the Team Day and our team is looking for somebody who has the foundational qualities of a leader, uh, because that's what we are when we're going into business. We're going to be leading uh, people to uh, and, and creating opportunities for them as a franchisee. And um, I need to uh, attract people that are, number one, the foundational quality that we're looking for is somebody who's hungry. Uh, if you're not hungry, uh, you're not probably not going to last uh, in a business, especially when you're starting up. Even though it's a franchise, you have systems, you have culture, you have all these things that were wonderful that we all talk about. Um, it's, it's hard to put together a team of people that are going to drive business to scale uh, in their territory with whatever product and service that they're, they're bringing. Um, and then another thing is, is being honable. Uh, we call them the three H's. Uh, honable is just another way, a fancy way of saying, so we can have three H's, uh, teachable. Um, but you want people that are going to be teachable. They're going to listen to the support that your team, that you've worked so hard on at the franchise l or level to help them to be successful. Um, so making sure that um, that person has those kind of qualities, asking them when they come to the Meet the Team Day, having your team sit with them to make sure that, give them examples. Tell me about a time when you uh, were learned something new or uh, did this or that. Uh, really diving deep into who that person is and what kind of experience that they're bringing to the table that's going to help enhance uh, the franchise uh, experience, not just for themselves, but for the rest of the franchisees that they're going to be collaborating with too and as well as your team that's gonna have to work with them. And then the last one is just um, honorable. Honorable person is somebody who's a person who has a level of character and uh, business ethics and they're not gonna go into somebody else's territory <laughs> and, and do work in their zip code. Um, we've never had that happen, by the way. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, those are the three things. And, and when you have something like that to work off of, that gives you the foundation to be able to have somebody that's going to perform, right, with your system. And if they're going to be f performing uh, and getting through that startup, then they're going to be able to lead, and then they're going to be able to develop leaders within our organization that are developing leaders eventually to scale that organization. And in our organization, it's trucks, right? You know, I don't want somebody to buy a brother's gutters and stay at one truck. I want them to go to three and four and five trucks and beyond, and maybe even have some satellite offices within their territory. Uh, so those are some of the things that I think are really good foundational qualities. And then having those interwoven into your system so that that can support the franchise but beyond that, it's got to go, I think, even down to the people that they're hiring. Um, th that has got to translate through in your system. Uh, I think a lot of franchise concepts train their franchisees, but then there's nothing, there's no clear pathway to success, which I think is even more important for the people that they're going to hire. Uh, so we have a program called the Skills Ladder Program, uh, which does that, and we have a learning management department, or a learning department, and that department has put everything in a, a an LL, LMS system so that everybody in the company from sales to the back office to the production are all learning and has a continual educational path that's not only going to benefit them monetarily as they become more proficient, but it's going to help them to see and uh, transfer that model and that whole into our organization so that, you know, ultimately, uh, my franchisees, our goal is to get them to have a business that runs without them having to be there on the day-to-day. -day. 
Okay. Thanks, Ken. Yeah. Uh, John, your thoughts on intake? Um, so I think, uh, uh, just to uh, echo a little bit uh, here, um, the, the uh, I, I, see, I see a gentleman here with an EOS on, on a shirt here, so uh, I know uh, uh, we're, we're an EOS uh, bo uh, uh, based company here, and in, in EOS there's something called the, uh, uh, you know, having the shared vision, uh, 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 or having like an EOS vision is that everybody in the organization understands your vision, they can answer eight questions about it, you know, what is your, what are your core values, what's your core focus, what do you do, you know, what's your marketing strategy, things like that, that if everybody in the organization from the franchisee all the way to the frontline staff all totally understand that as clear as day in the same way you're going to get much more of a I guess an or uh, I guess everyone oaring or, or rowing I guess in the uh, in the right in that same direction there so um, so going from you know having uh, your you know having the same standards for franchisees and saying you all you have to align with the, uh, the uh, you know in our case the driven principles or the core values of the company you know you, and then you have to express to the to your franchisees listen part of the magic that got us you know our high our highly successful locations was having consistent team members all r rowing in the same direction and so it's if you uh, you know it's, it's it's also to you have new franchise owners that Maybe this is one, uh, you know one of their first or second businesses. They're still getting used to hiring people, things like that. It is a skill set, and they may not understand the damage that can happen if you have somebody who does not align with that vision or values. It can become toxic. It can become a, a really negative thing. So uh, for us, for the intake side, for for staff, we express to the franchisee, listen. You know, bare minimum, you have to make sure that they, uh, uh, you know, that they are, if they are the right person for your organization, do they align with your, um, uh, uh, with your core values, and are they in the right seat? So do they get, for the job, do they get it, do they want it, do they have the capacity to do it? And so uh, it's a really simple exercise, but if you provide them that, uh, that process, you're more likely going to have that uh, the right people entering on the front lines that al aligned with the core values, and that's a really powerful thing. Very good, thanks. John. Carolyn, your thoughts on, on new franchise intake to screen them and make sure they're rowing in the same direction? Yeah, so I, um, the core values, we use that as, we, as I stated earlier, um, but the first red flag would be um, not having faith in our um, model. And I know that sounds um, unusual but we have a particular target market that we're focused on and we have potential franchise owners that don't quite get it and because we're a home care they think we're going to service everyone right and that's not how our model works so we have a specific target market and so some of them they'll keep asking questions and it's leading away from what our target market is and so that's a very big because to me that means you don't have faith in our model we've been doing this since 2006 and you're saying well are you sure you can find those type of clients well you know to me, so it, so that's the number one thing so we look at that piece of just as um, that would be a red flag um, for, for me so I, I think it's an un yeah question please Yes. Talk a lot about building these relations, mm -hmm. maintaining them, mm -hmm. but this intake phase is so key. Mm -hmm. And we talk a lot about the positive stuff. What are, what are some more red flags? Mm -hmm. That would be great. Yeah. You guys, you guys want to touch on that for a second? Sure. Um, huh. We had a, a guy that stands out. He was just um, a negative Nelly that came into our. Um, confirmation day and what we do at our confirmation day we have an exit interview at the end we do we model a crew leader meeting a sales meeting and and you know they get to be a fly on the wall and see the inner workings of what a franchise business could grow to and be because uh, Ryan and I kept our corporate location running as an example for that uh, for Z's and and one of the things that we look for is um, this one guy came in and he's like he just was really negative on on and every on everything um, he even said you know um, oh, I was bankrupt three times and he went into this all his personal stuff and it was you know he was an open book but it was like in the total wrong direction and my team was just like ah oh, why not you know we can we have a conference after what do you guys think of the fr franchisees who would you cut who would you keep and um, 
you know, and that's a standard procedure for us to do at the end of a confirmation day. And there's like this guy, he's negative Nelly, man. He just was talking about all this stuff and how he was in a lawsuit with this franchise before that. Those are clearly <laughs> red flags, right? Um, uh, but then it's tough, you know, sometimes people um, are interview well, right? How many of us have hired employees that interviewed well and then a couple weeks or months later, everybody on your team's like, I don't know, but this guy doesn't seem like he fits our culture, you know. Um, it happens with franchisees, and they can they can scoot in. Uh, but it's, um, you know, I, I think when you drill down into it and you have a really good vetting process um, and having yourself aligned with a process and a team that can, you know, you have your marketing team sit with them, you have an opportunity for them to sit with your um, whatever departments that you have within your business and that, that team feedback and then you doing an exit interview with them and then, you know, giving some time for it to settle. Um, you know, some of the red flags, like our business is not, it's a highly skilled business and you have to deal with blue collar workers. And, you know, if somebody is, you know, if they have all kinds of health problems, you know, I'm probably not going to say nothing about that, right? Because I'm not going to get in legal trouble. But, you know, our team's going to come back and say, hey, listen, this business probably could put this guy in the grave. You know, uh, you have to really know who it is that you want and, and the person that you're looking for and that your team is all on the same page, I think, is really important to making sure that you're weeding out any potential. Because the one thing that you don't want is somebody to get in just you don't want to get people into your business just to make a sale. You want people in there that's going to be a good fit for them uh, all around and a good fit for your team who's going to ultimately be partnering and working with them. Yeah, so uh, the two words I got out of that was uh, bankrupt and lawsuit. If those, <laughs> if those words come up, uh, yeah, that's a red flag. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll share here too, I mean, uh, uh, we, we were able to, uh, 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 working with Franchise Fastlane, uh, achieve some pretty remarkable growth here over the past 18 months. But um, in the very beginning, I understand, especially if there's some early franchisors here, uh, you know the the first you know the first handful of franchisees that come in you're just so excited to uh, to do the deal and you know it's a great learning experience but then uh, when they're not the right person and those red flags are ignored uh, uh, you know you're buying yourself uh, you know it's it's like you know it, like they say franchising is like getting uh, getting married you know seeing a huge red flag in someone you're dating and still marrying them and then you're upset that you know now they're crazy and you're married, <laughs> like, you know, that, that, that sort of thing. So I think that, that that's uh, that's an important element to uh, to keep up. But uh, I mean, yeah, it's it's uh, and, uh, uh, I think the the big thing here is actually I find you know going around with your team and you know because they might if you'll have your avatar of who you need or want in your organization. And it can be a very simple, do you, and for us, you know, with the driven principles, do you think they demonstrated in that meeting that they were, they've been resourceful, that they will be resourceful, that they'll figure things out as they need to? And it's like, I didn't really quite get that, right? And so you can either follow up and, you know, ask more directive questions based on that core value or that core element of their avatar that, uh, that's there. And if, I mean, it's not a science, it's, it's a little bit of an art, but it's like, were, was it acceptable of, of, uh, of an answer? Uh, uh, for that there. So I think that that is, uh, uh, is a big thing. But also, too, I found it very, very helpful to even just go across uh, uh, the whole leadership team there as well. Just uh, what did you think? What did you think? Because there were people that came in that I loved, and then my, my team were like, listen, okay, we can't take them because of X, Y, and Z. I'm like, oh, I, I did not think of that. <laughs> yeah, you're right. So getting feedback uh, as well, uh, getting out of your lens uh, and being objective based on those values is, is pretty critical. But, uh, mm -hmm. and then you'll be able to see those red flags, uh, or should be, not always, but should be. But yeah, bankrupt or lawsuit, that's bad, really bad. <laughs> Carolyn. <laughs> so the, the other thing that we, that would be a red flag is in our model, we're really looking for um, owner operators. Mm -hmm. And so we have someone come to the table and they're still trying to decide whether or not they're going to quit their job or not. So 
and I used to not be comfortable. I would, I want it for them. Oh yeah, you could do it. We'll be able to help you work through it, but that's not the right thing. And it's not going to work in our system, but what our system, the way it's set up is that we will help you become, um, you start operating in your business, but we're going to teach you how to work your way out of that business so you can work on your business. So right now, that's how our model works. So if someone's coming and that doesn't line up, unless, you know, if they have the capital to support putting the right people in place and following the process, that's something that can be looked at. But most of the people that are coming to us are looking at actually being the, um, the owner, them, you know, actually starting in their business. So um, that would be one thing that, uh, another red flag that would pop up um, for me. There's probably, we have a team, um, we're small, and there's, only, there's four of us on our executive team. And when we first started, we made uh, an agreement <laughs> that if all four of us were not in agreement, if one person just said no and they couldn't explain why that feeling was there, that we all, we would just not go forward with that. And so um, as long as we keep doing that, Hopefully, <laughs> you know, I don't know how long, but for right now, that seems to be working. Um, Charles, he's a great um, salesperson. Everyone loves him. He'll bring great people to the table, but then we have people on our team who are really good at asking the really tough questions, and questions I would not even ask, and then you're sitting there, and you're like, oh, gosh, I'm glad they asked that question, because maybe their expectation in franchising was totally not how the model works, but it comes out through just having these conversations. But you have to have people on your team who are good at asking those tough questions. They're good at getting, you know, it's, it's a well balanced. Yeah. So, so sharing, one second, sharing something that I overheard, and it's, it's you know, if, if the person's in the room that's responsible for this story, maybe call on you to share a little bit more, but group discovery days, one of the first steps was to take all the people out and take them into the indoor go-kart racing and then just sort of watch them, kind of rats in a maze, see who's cheering for somebody else, see who's sitting over there on the phone being antisocial, see who's ramming people on the course to get out of the way. <laughs> Tells a lot, but they said the people that cheer for the others and, and look at it as an exciting social event were the ones that, that made the cut. But uh, in terms of the questions, that's, that's probably a really good point on the red flags. What kind of questions do you guys have or have you heard asked in discovery days and, and even in you know, the entire franchise sales process that helps suss out uh, somebody's character? Uh, any from, anything from the audience? Right. And one thing to add, too, to what you were saying about, um, you know, you have certain models where you have owner operators and then you have semi-passive. We happen to do both, but it doesn't mean that somebody who wants to be semi-passive is a good fit for semi-passive. And in all the franchises that we've sold, I would say our experience has been if somebody's career in transition has never owned a business before and they want to do their job still and be semi-passive in something, uh, it's, it's uh, first of all, they don't have the knowledge of business ownership. Um, and it's not the same as being in a job most of the time. And most of the people that are successful in semi-passive are people that have had multiple businesses, have, it's not their first rodeo, and they have the capital to do so. Because um, it does take a lot of capital and it extends out typically the break even in your business for that to, to happen. Uh, so that's just something I'd like to add that's been our experience when you're dealing with that. So really know, uh, and it's good that you, you know it's owner operator, if they're looking to operate semi-passive then no go. So really knowing that is, is super important, and then the team knowing that uh, I think is great. Let's, let's have two questions. The gentleman in the quiet pants here. <laughs> <laughs> Who let him in here? <laughs> uh, so kind of sticking with the culture and protecting of the culture, not only do you have that ongoing once they're in the system, but then this intake piece is critical as well. Um, as you're evaluating candidates and where you, you know, 
where does the cutoff line go? Do I measure? Do I not? I'm curious. Are you are you taking the approach that we eliminate the obvious red flags but let in the maybes and the home runs, or do you only take the home runs? And I ask because we have been surprised what people become once they become business owners, especially if you're most of yours are first timers. They come in as an employee mm -hmm. with a mindset, and they're trying to get into this other. <laughs> it's tough. It's so tough. It, yeah. In, in my experience, I mean, there are people that I've had. That, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, uh, he's, he's our plant in the audience for, for the question. <laughs> anyway, so uh, uh, no, I think um, uh, it's tough because uh, you're right. Like, how can you possibly know? There have been people that uh, we've brought on and I'm like, oh, like a, a really good guy, right person. I don't know if this is the right seat for them, but there's something maybe. Maybe, and then it's, you know, then it's up to that individual as an entrepreneur to go and, you know, rise up to that occasion and go for it. And I've been re pleasantly, remarkably surprised, uh, you know, there are people I was like, I'm really worried about this person, I don't know. And uh, then they're, you know, be, end up being a top performer in the, in the whole company there. And they just say, I just follow the system. I don't know what else everyone else is doing. And you're like, thank you, thank you. <laughs> but um, I, I think too, it's, that you know, the, uh, what we've started to try to communicate more is the emotional roller coaster that it is going to be an entrepreneur, especially yeah. for the first time. I mean, we did a case uh, study of our top performing franchisees and our lowest performing franchisees, and it's quite clear there is a profile of our top uh, performing franchisees. They are former business owners. They uh, are, um, you know, they, they, they've. They've done something like similar. They've run crews before, and then they just take this and run with it. But then there's also the middle of the pack, which you also need uh, as well in your organization. And uh, you know those uh, those can turn out really well. So it's finding out you know who those avatars are uh, uh, to be able to to to, to work, work work with that there. And I think that that it, all of those things all uh, put together, it's it's a bit of an art in a way <laughs> and uh, a leap of faith in a lot of ways, but. I think it's just starting with uh, non-negotiables yeah, too. That's like, like, like that's, that's it. it. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, this person reminds me so much of this other franchisee, uh, and their background is very similar. And it's like we don't need more of those people in our system. You know, so even comparing, uh, you know, for, like personalities to existing people in the system has helped. So, and I've been bitten before. I was like, man, that guy reminds me so much of that the worst guy we've ever had. <laughs> Oh, let's see. And oh, here we go. <laughs> Same thing. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so we got a couple stack, uh, questions stacking up. If I could come to you, please. Sorry. Franchisees actually asked for a couple exceptions. We were able to work them out through legal, like nothing serious, mm -hmm. right? But of course, my advisor was right. Once an exception, always an exception, and it never ended after that. Mm -hmm. So he's a franchisee of mine, but it's a never ending process with him. It's always something that he's asking for an exception for. So for everybody in this room, like, yeah. it's just, don't take this lightly. It is a big deal. That's right. Let's go yeah. to the right field here. I know you had a question. We'll come to you, sir. Yeah, and I feel bad, too. It was actually more of a comment um, because I wanted to continue the dialogue about sussing out candidates during that process. And I resonated with um, the guy who had a question or um, a follow-up question two people ago because we have franchisees that range in all types of personalities. Our system is so diverse in just how people respond to conflict. And... At the end of the day, when I'm in those discovery days, I really try to get, honestly, a little vulnerable with our candidates and see if they can meet mm -hmm. me there, um, which will tell me like how they're gonna deal with that conflict in the future or any tension or hard conversations. And if they can meet me there, I'm like, okay, regardless of how you talk, if you're more aggressive or more passive, at least you can be a little human in these moments, and I think that's what makes us successful. Mm -hmm. Very good, yeah. thank you. Yes, sir. So my question would be, does anybody use the franchise candidate profile 
uh, assessments that are out there where you can just do their personality assessment whether they'll be a good franchise owner in your system. Um, and are they effective? Mm -hmm. It's where we're looking. So this might be the right tool for us. Yeah. Uh, in, in my experience, I've seen you know Myers Briggs and Caliper and McQuaig and all those other things. It's uh, it's it's one data point. I don't think it's a silver bullet for any of that you know, panel. Uh, uh, for, uh, for for me, for uh, utilizing the EOS system with the people analyzer, it's simple, it's free, and uh, you know it, it's it's just a really quick check. It's like you know, is this the right person? Do they align with the values? Each one of them, you know, we go one by one, and then you know, do do they have do they get what being a franchisee is? Do they or, or even to, uh, you know going down to the frontline staff? Do they get what it means to be in this role? Do they want it? Do they want to be successful at it? And uh, do they have the capacity to, capacity to do it, right? And that capacity can mean time, it can mean uh, you know skills, expertise, it's uh, anything, right? Uh, so I think that uh, uh, I, I never uh, never went down. Well, we did like disc profiles and things like that. I found it was it, it, that didn't work for us. Uh, the people analyzer worked. I don't know if you guys have anything different. Yeah, disc profile. Um, we've we've used that kind of uh, profile. Uh, we tend to have most of our franchisees have a little bit of the D of the disc profile in them. Uh, I think you need that in home services to begin with to command respect of the guys in the field, especially because if you're a totally passive, like S personality, um, they're going to walk all over you. And uh, especially when you start. Um, so I would say that as far as uh, profiling, um, we're looking for somebody that is not going to get walked all over, uh, especially when they're starting up with a couple guys, um, you know, when you have depth in your team and stuff. Uh, but I've seen people in all different personalities be successful, and it really comes back to those three H's I was talking about earlier. If i got an S that's super hungry and really knows his why, and he puts his – he knows his weakness, uh, maybe he can hire somebody that can uh, pick up uh, where he's maybe not so strong in, uh, then, then that could work. Um, but, you know, I've seen all kinds of situations and all kinds of profiles of people be successful and, and, and others that don't. We, we use a um, Kobe model which deals with your mode of operation. So to help our franchisees, first of all, help us understand how they operate so that we, it helps in our communication, <laughs> so that when I have to communicate with them, I'm approaching them in the way that they receive the information. So right now we've been using that for a couple of years, so we're still trying to really get a good analysis on it, but it's helping us be able to help them even identify what they're weak in, and they'll know how to bring, build um, who they need to bring onto their team with them. So this, this, yes, please. Well, Jim, I would just add to that. I'm Diane Davis. I'm a happy and healthy with the Just Between Friends before is that we use Zorik all. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the only one that's designed for the franchise system. And, and she, Rebecca uses eight sciences. And she's as close to looking in your head and seeing what's in there as anybody. And it's another tool. It's mm -hmm. not, it doesn't decide <coughs> anything, but it gives you another tool. I like it because not only does it help you look at the person and see if they match the profile of what your existing successful franchise <laughs> looks like, it also helps your field coaches be able to see, okay, this is the person, this is where they're weak, this is where they're strong, I know where I'm going in with this person. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I just think it's another tool, it's a good one, and I, I, I want to have as many tools as possible in my tool belt, yeah. trying to find franchisees, yeah. because it's, it's, it's that's the finding the secret sauce of those great successful franchisees is, is just not an exact science. Indeed. Uh, question again. Definitely a question. When you talk about the assessments that you have the candidates or the franchisees um, complete, what is the, like, what are the practical steps after you get that information? Is it just a small team that meets together and talks about those results? Is it one person? Like, can you kind of dive into that? Yeah, so we actually meet um, with the candidate and the four people on the executive team, and we're talking about it and explaining to the candidate, um, you know, if they're in agreement, and then that helps us to even um, see how the communication goes. If they're totally 
like um, argumentative or, you know, it, it kind of gives us a good feeling this isn't going to work, especially if they're our business coach is the one that's facilitating that, and that's the one that they're going to have a lot of contact with. <laughs> and so if there's already conflict happening there, this might not be good. That's good. Thank you. Kelsey, did you have another question before? No, I was, I was on the Zorical track. Um, we use it as well, and they, you can kind of identify your top performers. They created a, basically an avatar, mm -hmm. and then incoming candidates are measured and compared against your top performing avatar. So like a disc or something like that is kind of population generic, where something like Zorical is literally brand and cultural specific. Interesting. To your yeah, it, it's like, it's, it's as close to reading your company's DNA as possible, and then comparing the candidate to that specific avatar, which is really helpful. But it is just a data point. Yeah. But it's spooky, reliable. <coughs> All right, so I'm going to pivot for one reason uh, away from the intake and, and address something that our organizers asked to address in this, in this forum. So the labor market is really tight. There's a right way and a wrong way to hire people. Uh, a lot of franchisees come into your systems with no experience in hiring or firing or managing or anything like that. Uh, you do now have, you know, I come from the great country of California, as they say. Uh, you know, there's a lot of focus being put on employment practices, and, and you've got to do everything you can to... Uh, remove any signs of control, especially around employment practices. So if I'm dealing, if, if you're dealing with folks that are coming in with no real practical hiring experience, what kind of conversations or coaching events might you have without stepping on that third rail that could be construed as employment control? If that's, if that's a valid question read, for you. Read hire, Hiring ta Talent by uh, Tom Foster. I'm sorry? <laughs> Tom Foster, Hiring Talent. I, we recommend that book okay. uh, right, right when uh, they signed. Um, as a as a as a good starting point, uh, but also you know we're training them through training of how to do that, and we have questions and things that you can ask, and um, uh, and then also um, practicing it, practicing it, role playing it. You know, don't be so uh, well. That person didn't have a cover letter. Or this person and and most guys that are in the trades don't have cover letters, by the way. Um, <laughs> but you know. Practice, get as many resumes and as many appointments as you possibly can in a day so that you can get really good at interviewing. And, um, and, and then that's it. It's, uh, and then talking to other franchisees that are having success with that. Uh, the biggest thing about a, a play, play uh, retention and, and recruiting, we find, is that it's the activity. A lot of times guys, when they start up a business, they'll, oh, I got my team. But that might not be the team that you came up the training with that will be with you next week or the next month. They, they might be gone. Um, so, you know, always keeping the activity level high just as if you would, you know, anything in your business. And I think that's really important to have a bench uh, is what we call it, having a bench of people that if somebody quits and leaves that you have, you know, three or four more other people sitting there saying, hey, I'm ready to put my two weeks notice in. Um, when can I come and work for you? Um, and I think casting that vision as uh, the Z and teaching them how to do that to people of, hey, we're here right now, this is where we want to go, and I want you to be an integral part of the team to take us there. I think that's really important uh, for people and attracting them and keeping them in your business. And then, and then do what you say you're going to do. You know, grow that business. Get it to the second and the third truck while they're there and do it quickly uh, because that will show them that you really mean what you say. John, do your employee, I mean, your franchisees look to you for guidance on hiring? Uh, well, the, the guidance that we give is uh, really acknowledgement that a hiring is an active skill and it uh, does need to be, it's not something you just run off the side of your desk. It's something you have to be intentional, uh, that you have to, uh, you know, really understand your tactics because rec uh, attracting, recruiting, retaining, uh, like the actual act of interviewing and hiring people, that's a... Uh, that's a whole deep ocean right there. And then you have franchisees all at the same time, you know, still trying to learn how to make pretzels or whatever it is, like that, that kind of thing. So uh, it's uh, a lot of it is expressing to them, listen, and, and saying right up front, in our relationship, we are limited to what we can do. And it is for the greater good, the protection of, of the whole brand. And 
they understand that, and uh, you know you're, you don't hide that. That should be up front and center, like in you know in the sales process and things like that, as to how they're going to get the tools or the the guidance from you, but not the actual work from you, and how they're going to go find their own people. So I think uh, setting those expectations uh, uh, from the beginning are, are critical, and then yeah, just expressing things like the can the candidate experience uh, is incredibly important and. Here are best practices, and you know, also to facilitating best practices roundtables amongst franchisees as well uh, is critical. Very good, Carolyn. Anything to add on that? Yeah. So, what along with everything that they stated, we also partner with um, Paychex is our preferred provider. So, every franchisee that comes on board, they are introduced um, to them, and they assist with a lot of the HR issues that may come up or questions that come up, um, providing assistance with them completing their um, employee handbook. Um, so that partnership really helps and I feel like that's a protection for us as the franchisor and with them understanding our industry and how we work and we invite them in on some of our quarterly meetings so that they can do some specific trainings. So that's, that's how we're handling. Very good. So just another personal experience here. One of our most successful franchise owners is a gentleman in Atlanta. Uh, he's got a practice and he's probably got the highest retention of high quality employees. And during his interview process, he'll boil it down to two candidates and eat, ask each of them to come in for a day and pay him $150 just to shadow and, and you know, learn the business. It also gives them a great opportunity to see what that person's all about. That's true. So something to consider. And, and I wanted to emphasize there too, your, your point on, uh, on strong retention as well. I mean, uh, that's, that's another element I think is undertrained uh, in the, you know, we train, how, how do you find people? How do you find people? But I think it's equally as important is how, you know, what are best practices in retaining people? And, you know, we emphasize for our franchisees, listen, you gotta go do a, you know, beer and wing night, you know, once a, so some sort of cult, some sort of culture event once a quarter with your team and you, they're going to come back. And then that way, I mean, you lower your exposure because you got less, technically less hiring going on because there's less turnover and never, everybody's happier, that kind of thing. Very good. Carolyn, do you have something else? Yeah, because along with what you're saying, they, people we're finding, they just want to be heard. They just want to know that you, um, you really care about them. So even for the team to understand how important it is just to take out a minute and just say, or send them a thank you, or, or provide them some um, Chick-fil-A cards or something, they appreciate those type of things. Okay. Uh, questions? Yeah, Kelsey. Yeah, so around hiring, No, we, all of our franchisees do their own training, but we have different um, strategic partners where they can um, get online training courses, they can partner with, and we um, provide that access to them. Yeah. Go ahead, John. Uh, we provide all the resources, but they have to facilitate it at that point. Mm -hmm. okay. We have a training facility, it's a 3,000 square foot facility, and it has uh, multiple, probably 12 different all gutter station where they can learn every single scenario. So let's say somebody comes to training and then a couple months later their guys decide they're going to work somewhere else or whatever. They can send people back up to training and, and we'll train them in the same spot for them and, and take care of them and make them make sure that they're out. Uh, but as far as training too in other departments when it comes to sales, uh, we do uh, boot camps and all kinds of webinars and continuous training on a monthly basis. Our, our people also are getting a coach assigned to them for the life of their business. That's going to talk about business strategy. Um, and Ryan and I do a podcast, so when you start getting bigger and scaling, it's really tough to, you know, we have the OGs on our Slack feed, and then we have our general feed with all the franchises, so it's gotten to a point where it comes really tough for even Ryan and I uh, to uh, communicate, um, you know, what our 
our, 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 you know, the culture, the core values and all those things um, of Brothers Gutter. So we started a podcast uh, about a year and a half ago. So that would also be able to a way for us to have a voice with our franchisees, but also to collaborate with them and have them on, especially top performers, uh, to be on there. Uh, so they get to have a voice too, uh, to the rest of the organization. And uh, it's funny because it's grown beyond that. It's called Grow With The Bros. And uh, we just talk about business. Uh, we have one coming up um, uh, Monday the 9th, uh, dealing with the imposter syndrome and the head trash that goes into that. Um, and uh, our brand president, Danny Horbachuk, will be on that. But that's some ways that you could get in front of your uh, franchisees so that they can hear your voice and your vision and, and, and some of the things that can drive those things. Yeah, yeah. yeah annual convention yeah and we have quarterly um, meetings and then we um, have an annual franchise celebration is what we do once a year that's great yes so please do a weekly or monthly communication with your franchisees and how do you guys disseminate that information mm -hmm. um, for for us we we have a podcast too so that's on a monthly basis and that's uh, uh, you know while we do uh, we don't do the skill building which is an awesome idea uh, the mm -hmm. well we it's more of like uh, company news you know, events, things like that. It's a, it's a live show. They can join in, and then you know, it's kind of like a call-in radio show at that point. You know, people can uh, can come in, and they're allowed to come trash us if they want. It's fine. Uh, we're like, bring it. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, but uh, the uh, once uh, and then, yeah, it's recorded and sent out, and and uh, a written, you know. Um, uh, I guess summary of what was discussed was also sent out there. So that's on a monthly basis, but we're also pretty active on our franchise Slack channel there as well. So, you know, things things pop up in day to day and we're able to communicate with that. Yeah, we do, I do, well, we do a weekly message out and it can be on various things, events. It could be just a message of the vision that we want to cast. Um, um, maybe a situation came up within the brand and we think there needs to be more education, but we do a weekly type of um, message right now, which is more like an email type that we're doing. Yeah. Uh, we, we send out a, a Monday morning every, every Monday at 7 a.m., something called At HQ This Week, and it's sort of done in the format of an old Kiplinger letter. You know, it's just little snippets with links, mm -hmm. but the beauty of sending out through Constant Contact is you can measure the engagement, see who's reading it, see who's opening it, see who's clicking specific articles. Good measurement technique, but uh, it's been embraced by our system. You know, so no, none of the franchisees are getting flooded by you know, emails from the HQ office coming from all different departments. It's one centralized communication, and it really cleared the air on a lot of things. So. I like that. So. Uh, other questions, thoughts? I don't do a podcast, no. no. Are the podcasts just for your system, or are you putting it out for everybody? You know, it's funny. It's uh, grown beyond our system. Um, so it's it's uh, on YouTube. It's other business owners. I, I get calls from business owners. Hey, when are you guys going to do another podcast? Mm -hmm. um, so it's 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 grown uh, beyond our system, which has been pretty cool, uh, which is great for your business. I mean, think about it. You know, you, you're still you're looking for potential territories to be filled, and that could be one way that you could attract other franchisees that are like minded. You know, in in your values and what you're talking about in your podcast. <laughs> oh yeah, we had a wives podcast of franchisees. Uh, so yeah, you could you could be on our podcast, sure. Yes. So you came to the point that one franchisee that is just not doing anything right, and the time has come for you to sympathize. Mm -hmm. Explain. Well, I guess you addressed how that be. <laughs> uh, so seek good uh, counsel. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's a great question. Um, you know, when it comes to where you're getting to the point where they're just not uh, complying, they're not engaged anymore, uh, it's time to sit down and say, hey, you know, we need to sit down and this obviously isn't the right fit. Um, and what can we do to help you to exit the business in the most gracious way um, that we we can we can do this and um, and typically that'll for for us it's resulted in them and us helping them to we don't mediate it but the idea of reselling to an existing location which is the nice thing of being having a lot of units sold and a lot of franchisees in the beginning when you have that. Um, 
you know, the, you're better off letting them out of the agreement in the beginning. And we've had a few of those in the beginning where their heart just wasn't in it. Uh, letting them out of the agreement, let it part ways as friends, I think is the best way. And my lawyer always said, avoid litigation, mm-hmm. avoid litigation. Yeah. Don't go after them, let them go. And, and then they'll speak. And what's good about that too, is those people still validate for us because franchisees that are coming to your system, they're going to find those people. They're going to call them up. And the, the last thing you want is all oh, those guys were a bunch of, you know, jerks. Um, and, we don't have that we have guys that say you know what they were very good they let me out of the agreement that everything went smoothly and you know i have nothing good to say about you know brothers gutters and and that business um so i think that's the happy medium for us that we try to to come to when it when that happens yeah it's it's a concept uh that that i learned over the years it was called uh exit with honor uh you know whether they uh, it's just a stance you need to have as a, as a franchisor, um, and it's inevitable. It's a number. It's eventually going to happen, and uh, you know it's it's one of those things where you know if say you have somebody where it isn't right for them, and you know it's like listen, uh, you're right. Like we had, a, a, you came and said to me, I want to have a 10 year agreement. You have minimum royalties in that agreement, and I expect it to you know develop at that certain rate. And now you're not holding up your end of the agreement. You, I mean, you can't get stuck on. Well, screw you. Uh, uh, you know, this is just like it's a partnership, and it's not right for them. And and you know, you don't want somebody around like that anyway. So, it's uh, one of those things where uh, other franchisees are going to be looking at you too, because uh, they're going to say, you know, say they have an issue or something that you know that that's got to pop up. They got to know that you're a gracious, reasonable partner, uh, as we all need to be good business partners in, in this uh, this business here. And uh, I just find it builds a lot more credibility, uh, especially when hairy situations come up, uh, that they know that uh, fair, reasonable, they're not just getting their feathers up immediately anytime that ha- anything happens. So just two reasonable people getting together. I did, though everything they said <laughs> I think I really I think it helps with the relationship and that whatever you've been building because those are some hard questions because myself I have faith that someone can truly do it but they have to have faith in themselves too and sometimes people it could be life situations just come up that prevents them from being able to and maybe have going to them with a way out makes it easier for them and they're they're thanking you <laughs> because maybe they wanted, you know, they they needed that. So I think it's good just to have that relationship that you can go to them and let's talk about this. Because you don't want someone in there, well, I know I don't, that's just suffering and really doesn't want to be there. It's not good for them and it's not good for us as a brand either. Yeah. Okay, we're a few minutes uh, over and, and lunch is downstairs, but I want to take a chance to see if there's any other questions in the audience here or any thoughts you want to share with the group? That's what we've done. To we have not enforced it yet. Well, that's the thing, right? You got somebody else right behind them that want to buy that didn't have a, maybe an opportunity to buy. So you're going to be able to. I don't know. You know, you just got to feel what's right for you for how you want to do business and conduct your business. And for me and Ryan, that, we are always taught take the high road. And for us, that that's the high road for us. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Okay, so, so before we break, how about one round of applause for our panelists here?